Congratulations! If you clicked on this video, you're likely starting up your grand journey into the world of Final Fantasy XIV. You've made an excellent choice. Let me first say welcome, and I hope you have a great time. That being said, it can be a little bit daunting jumping right in, especially if you're using a controller and are accustomed to the more traditional keyboard and mouse playstyles of other MMORPGs. But don't fret, controller support is top notch in this game, and I actually prefer it over the alternative. To get you started, here are some easy tips and tricks that might clear up some confusion and make your transition into Eorzea just a little bit smoother. Number 1. Switch to Legacy Movement If you're using a controller or playing on console, you have the option to control your character either through Standard or Legacy Movement. In the main menu, under System, Character Configuration, Control Settings, General, Movement Settings, you'll find the options for Standard Type and Legacy Type. The game may default to standard, whereby the camera is fixed to your POV from the back. If you tilt the right stick to turn the camera, your character will also automatically turn as if they're looking in the same direction. This means that you are essentially locked into facing one way, and this really comes into play in the different directions your character can move. Going left and right becomes strafing motions, while moving backward is a slow backpedaling. The whole time, you remain facing forward as well. Legacy movement, on the other hand, decouples the camera and your character movements completely. Right stick is dedicated solely to the movement of the camera POV, while left stick enables you to freely move your character in all directions. See the difference between left, right, and backward movements between the two options, and how much further you can travel with Legacy. Legacy also allows you to quickly face away from your opponents, a popular mechanic for some enemies, with a down tilt of the left stick whereas for standard, you will have to turn your entire camera or character to achieve the same effect. It may feel awkward at first, but all in all, getting used to legacy movement will be less restrictive over standard and will only help you in the long run. Number 2. Set up your action bars Each job in the game has a ton of actions, and if you ever hope to be able to use them all, you'll need a lot more space than the default 16 slots initially available on controller. Of course, you can access your actions on the base crossbars by holding either right trigger or left trigger, but in the settings, you can also enable other commands to increase the number of actions easily available to you. From the main menu, under System, Character Configuration, Hotbar Settings, Custom, you'll find the options to enable expanded hold controls. Here, you can add the option to include additional crossbars by double tapping the right and left triggers and even more by doing a hold of the right trigger into left trigger and vice versa. This triples your available actions at the pull of a trigger and makes it much more manageable to insert all of your abilities into accessible crossbars. To make it so that your expanded crossbars are always visible, toggle in the cross menu and check on always display WXHB. You can also choose which crossbars the commands access and customize which of these crossbars are static or dynamic between all of your different jobs under Shared. For example, you can set one crossbar so that the actions will remain the same between job switches, things like sprint, limit break, teleport, and return, while the rest can swap back and forth for job-specific abilities. Remember that nearly anything can be added to the crossbar, items, menu shortcuts, etc so it would be worth it to set up your bars for ease of access as soon as you can. Number 3. Make targeting easy Starting out a controller, the fundamentals of targeting can be less than intuitive. Controller users don't have the luxury of easy point and click like those using a mouse and keyboard, but that doesn't mean targeting needs to be a hassle. In the main menu, under System, Character Configuration, Control Settings, Target, you'll see all the options for targeting. First, ensure automatically lock on target when initiating auto attack is turned off. Target lock is unnecessary in all circumstances. All it does is create a restrictive field of view and movements for your character around your target. There are no real benefits and simply target selecting, denoted by the arrow, is sufficient and allows you to do everything target lock does without those restrictions. I'd also recommend turning on automatically face target when using action, and auto target according to priority, plus enable full auto target. The former makes it so that you never have to worry about facing your character in the correct direction when you cast a spell or use a targeting ability, as they will automatically face toward your current target. And the latter makes it so that in a situation where you don't currently have a target selected, but you press a damaging ability or something, 
you will automatically target onto the nearest enemy. It may seem like a small thing, but these are two huge quality of life features. In situations where you're fighting a swarm of small enemies in a dungeon for instance, it becomes such a headache to have to manually target a new opponent each time your current target dies before being able to use your actions or spells again, or to have to reorient your character to face an enemy that's situated in a different direction. With these two settings checked, you can simply spam your button and continuously attack. Otherwise, you'd constantly get annoying error messages. I'd also highly recommend practicing the different methods of switching targets. One option is to use the right and left D-pad to cycle through your targets. Another option is to press the bumper while holding down a trigger. In the case where you just want to target the closest thing to you, it might even just be easiest to press B to untarget your current target, then press A, or use an ability, which should automatically target your nearest foe. These are for targeting enemies. If you're in a party and instead want to target one of your teammates, simply use the up and down D-pad to easily cycle through your members or yourself. Definitely play around with it and find your groove. Number four, customize and clean up your UI. This one ultimately comes down to personal preferences, but it can certainly be helpful to make your UI elements more readable. From the main menu, if you go into HUD layout, you'll find all the settings to modify your on-screen HUD interface. For one, if anything is glaringly in your way, you should move it to a more appropriate spot. The job gauges, for instance, initially appear pretty much right smack in the middle of the screen, but you can move them by searching under the current UI element drop-down menu and dragging them with the right stick to the side. On that note, you can also resize each of the individual elements. If your job gauge is too big, you can make it smaller and vice versa. You can even switch to a modified version that distills the information down to its most basic minimalist necessities if that's your fancy. Some elements can also be broken down into different parts as well. For example, the target bar has several sections, and each one can be separated out and manipulated individually. One thing I'd actually recommend is taking the target info progress bar, basically the enemy cast bar, blowing it up and moving it to a more centralized position on your screen. Normally, it is tucked away at the top near the enemy's health bar and can sometimes be easy to miss. This can be cumbersome if you want to make sure you always have an eye on what the enemy is casting, like if you know a certain move is especially deadly or you're waiting for the right time to cast an interrupt. By separating the cast bar out, making it bigger and moving it nearer to where your eyes naturally fall, you'll be in a much better position to ensure you won't miss a thing. In the end though, the world is your oyster when it comes to setting up your UI to how you like it. Checking out some guides can also give you some inspiration or new ideas for how to set up your own. Number five, remove animation bloat. This game has a lot of really cool battle animations, and many of them can be very flashy, which is a good thing. Obviously, you want to look cool while you're kicking ass. However, in a party of 4, or 8, or even 24, when everyone has flashy animations going on all the time, it can sometimes be impossible to actually see what's going on in battle. Luckily, there's a way to tone that down, or even turn it off altogether. This is another personal preference setting, but if you go into character configuration again, under control settings, character, you'll find the battle effect settings. In the beginning, it can be cool and super hype to see everyone's effects happening all the time, but over time, it might become, well, too much. Sometimes, it literally does become too much, and the animations end up preventing you from seeing important markers or mechanics in a fight. Turning down the effects to show limited or show none can offset those situations. Feel free to customize as well. I personally like to see all of my really cool effects with show all, but everyone else's I turn down to limited. Especially in higher end content where one misstep on a mechanic can lead to a wipe, clarity usually wins over cool. I, I can see! I can fight! Number six, navigate through all the names. Depending on how populated your server is, sometimes walking through a major city can feel like wading through a sea of text. It's just names, names, and more names everywhere. For many, this is a non-factor, but for others, it can kind of dampen the immersion and obscure how pretty some of the areas in the game are. Luckily, there are settings to modify how names appear in the game. In Character Configuration, under Display Name Settings, there are a ton of options to customize names. Names can be modified so that only four names or surnames are shown, or even just initials. 
Name colors for groups like friends or raid mates can be changed to your personal preferences as well. You can also choose to hide the names altogether, whether that be your own, other players, or lesser NPCs like minions and summons. As you can see, this can make a world of a difference for how the game looks. No longer will a quest giver be hidden by a swarm of player names all gathered around the same NPC. But then again, at times, seeing someone's clever name can enhance your experience too. Personally, I keep full names on, but hide all player names unless targeted. This makes it so that the overworld feels clean, but I can still surf through silly names if I ever get the urge. There are also options to change how names appear when you're in a party or in your chat window to increase clarity. You can customize the color of party members' names to correspond with their role, and even add an icon to correspond with their class or job. If you're one of those players that always seems to be out of range of your healer, for example, turning this on might be helpful so you'll never lose sight of them again. Hey, Freak Joe! You're going nowhere! Number 7. Bits and Bobs Gameplay Tips Finally, here are some little things to consider as you embark on your adventure. If you're feeling lost or don't know what to do next, just look to the top left corner of your screen. It will display the current or next MSQ, that's main scenario quest, as well as any vitally important quest beneath. That can be a job quest, or a mount unlock quest, or a necessary zone unlock quest. Usually, if there's a quest underneath, it's a pretty safe bet to do that one ASAP. By navigating and clicking on this banner, the game can lead you to the next logical step of your journey. Attune to Etherites and the Etherite network shards in the major hub cities as soon as possible. Etherites in the various overworld zones are a no-brainer for teleportation purposes, but don't sleep on also running around the main cities touching the small Etherite network shards. Chances are, you'll eventually need to go to all the random parts of the city at some point in your adventure, and having a nearby Etherite shard already attuned for quick teleportation makes the menial travel so much faster and more bearable. It's best to just knock it all out in one go and complete the network as soon as you can rather than waiting around for later. Always have your job stone equipped. At level 30 for each class, you unlock a quest to upgrade to the full-fledged job. Marauder becomes warrior, archer becomes bard, etc. etc. Once you've unlocked a job to receive the job stone, there is no reason not to have it equipped when playing that class or job. With the stone equipped, XP gains apply to both the class and the job, and you have access to job exclusive abilities you only hamper yourself by not having it equipped at that point. But it can sometimes slip through the cracks and you might forget, so just be sure that doesn't happen to you. And lastly, talk to your quest NPC friends. This final tip goes hand in hand with the Final Fantasy XIV mantra of enjoy the story. FF14 is a very story-driven game, and the best way to experience that is to immerse yourself as much as you can in the world and narrative. One small but impactful way you can do this is to speak to the characters that accompany you along the journey. Click on all your Scion friends that are crowded around the quest marker before you accept the quest. Do the same before you turn it in. See what Banquet is up to as he sits in the hallway of the Waking Sands. Interact with this party of other adventurers huddled near the entrance of Satasha. Nobody tells you to talk to them, and there's no direct incentive to do so. In most games, speeding through the quest accept, quest do, and quest turn in process is the common way to do things, and I mean that's totally acceptable to do here too. But if you lower the blinders and take the extra 15 seconds to absorb the optional flavor dialogue, you'll go through the game with a much better appreciation for the struggles of these characters who you'll eventually come to call your closest friends. Thanks for watching! I hope you found this video helpful or informative. If you're interested in more Final Fantasy XIV content, check out my other videos or try my MSQ playthrough guide on the Dawn Trail where I sometimes speak in funny voices. Good luck on your journey, Warrior of Light, and may the light of the crystal watch over you. Now, pray return to the waking sands.